Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Uh, I've been reading this, as usual, as, as of late, uh, on the exercise bike at the gym. I'm going to read you my bl uh, the blurb on the back, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so... Dane reads... Reclusive Hollywood icon Evelyn Hugo is finally ready to tell the truth about her glamorous and scandalous life. But when she chooses unknown magazine reporter Monique Grant to write her story, no one is more astounded than Monique herself. From making her way to Los Angeles in the 1950s to leaving show business in the 80s, and of course, the seven husbands along the way, Evelyn unspools a tale of ruthless ambition, unexpected friendship and a great forbidden love. But as Evelyn's story nears its conclusion, it becomes clear that her life intersects with Monique's own in tragic and irreversible ways. So let's go straight in. Uh, I love the dedication at the beginning. For Lila, smash the patriarchy, sweetheart. Fuck yeah, go Lila. So our main character, the journalist, who is about my age as well, so I kind of related to her a little bit. Um, she's having a tough old time. Um, but we get this little paragraph, which I just thought was very telling. I order myself pad thai and then get in the shower. I turn the water to nearly scalding hot. I love water so hot it almost burns. I love the smell of shampoo. My happiest place might just be under a shower head. It is here in the steam covered in suds that I do not feel like Monique Grant, woman left behind. Or even Monique Grant, stalled writer. I am just Monique Grant, owner of luxury bath product. She says, I once read that charisma is charm that inspires devotion, which is a great line. I assume that's lifted from somewhere. Not because uh, Taylor Jenkins Reid isn't capable of writing lines like that, that are really deep and insightful, but rather just because she said, I read somewhere, that makes me think, okay, Taylor Jenkins Reid read that somewhere, you know? So we start to learn a little bit about uh, Evelyn Hugo's past. So this is written in first person, but from Evelyn's point of view as she's telling the story. Um, and this first paragraph here is very, um, very apt. It kind of foreshadows what she had to do herself later on in her life. My mother had been a chorus girl off Broadway. She'd emigrated from Cuba with my father when she was 17. When I got older, I found out that chorus girl was also a euphemism for a prostitute. I don't, I don't know if she was or not. I'd like to think she wasn't, not because there's any shame in it, but because I know a little bit about what it is to give your body to someone when you don't want to, and I hope she didn't have to do that. And I love this, this, I like last words in general, I always think they're really interesting. I like, I can't remember what role Dahl's last words were supposed to be. He said something like, it is so beautiful here, I can now sleep or something. Like something poetic. And then his actual last words were fuck, because uh, a nurse injected him with morphine, he said fuck and then died. But anyway. Uh, I've often wished that on her deathbed she'd said something moving, something I could take with me always. But we didn't know how sick, but we didn't know how sick she was until it was over. The last thing she said to me was, "Deal, deal a tu padre que estaré en la cama." Tell your father I'll be in bed. I apologise for my Spanish. I've never studied Spanish. I know. See. So here we get a great example of how she ends up, um, you know, sacrificing her body to get what she, what she wants. Well, hello, Ari, I said, grazing my hand on his arm. I was 17. He was 48. That night, after his secretary left for the day, I was laid across his desk with my skirt around my hips and Ari's face between my legs. It turned out Ari had a fetish for orally pleasing underage girls. After about seven minutes of it, I pretended to erupt in reckless pleasure. I couldn't tell you whether it was any good, but I was happy to be there because I knew it was going to get me what I wanted. If the definition of enjoying sex means that it's pleasurable, then I've had a lot of sex that I didn't enjoy. But if we're defining it as being happy to have made the trade, then, well, I haven't had much I hated. And I like this, this little bit about laughs, because I think we all have laughs like this. Uh, my mum laughs. She's always had such a great laugh. It's very carefree, very young. Mine is inconsistent. Sometimes it's loud, sometimes it's wheezy. Other times I sound like an old man. David used to say he thought my old man laugh was the most genuine, because no one in their right mind would want to sound like that. Now I'm trying to remember the last time it happened. And uh, here's some more, some more from Evelyn's point of view. Um, she goes, I love the idea of making love to someone. I'd had sex before, but it never meant anything to me. I wanted to make love to Don. I loved him, and I wanted us to do it right. And then they get married. Don pulled me close and put his mouth to my ear, whispering, me and you, we will rule this town. We were married for two months before he started hitting me. End of chapter. Powerful end of chapter there. Another great little insight from Evelyn, what it's like to be famous. This is something that everyone should know about stars. We like to be told we are adored, and we want you to repeat yourself. Later in my life, people would always come up to me and say, I'm sure you don't want to hear me blabbering on about how great you are. And I always say, as if I'm joking, oh, one more time won't hurt. But the truth is, praise is just like an addiction. The more you get it, the more of it you need just to stay even. So Evelyn is out having, uh, you know, a swanky Hollywood lunch. And um, we get, I asked for the check. 
It's on the house, he said, which I thought was the stupidest thing, because if there is anyone that should be getting free food, it isn't rich people. Which is true. And she's talking to her friend, uh, slash lover, Celia, and, um... She asks, she asks uh, Evelyn if Don, her husband, does he do it for you? Yes, very much. Sometimes I find myself aching to be with him so much it embarrasses me. I don't know if a woman is supposed to want a man as much as I find myself wanting Don. Don may have taught me that I was capable of loving someone and desiring him, but he also taught me that you could desire someone even when you don't like him, that you can desire someone especially when you don't like him. I believe today they call it hate fucking, but it's a crude name for something that is a very human, sensual experience. And so they're off to an awards ceremony and again her relationship with Don is a little bit rocky. And we get, I walked up to Don. He always cleaned up nicely in his tux. There was no denying that he was going to be the most handsome man there, but I was tiring of him. What's that saying? Behind every gorgeous woman there's a man sick of screwing her. Well it works both ways, no one mentions that part. And she's getting a little bit jealous of all of the attention that Celie is getting because uh, she's younger and a better actress and all of that. Everyone was going to walk out of this theatre talking about Celia St. James. It should have made me afraid or jealous or insecure. I should have been plotting to one-up her in some way by planting a story that she was a prude or sleeping around. That is the fastest way to ruin a woman's reputation after all. To imply that she has not adequately threaded the needle that is being sexually satisfying without ever appearing to desire sexual satisfaction. Sadly still true. And we get this two lines of dialogue which, I mean I've never been divorced you know but I still thought it was interesting. Divorce is loss. Evelyn shakes her head. Heartbreak is loss. Divorce is a piece of paper. Actually, divorce is something that uh, Jedi's use. And this little passage was interesting about like the rich and their approach to money. Uh, you should know this about the rich. They always want to get richer. It is never boring getting your hands on more money. When I was a child, trying to find something to eat for dinner besides the old rice and dry beans in the kitchen, I would tell myself that if I could just have a good meal every night, I'd be happy. When I was at Sunset Studios, I told myself all I wanted was a mansion. When I got the mansion, I told myself all I wanted was two houses and a team of help. Here I was, just turned 25, already realising that no amount would ever really be enough. And Ruby gets this great line, she goes, You're not really famous if anybody still likes you. And we get this between uh, Celia and Evelyn. Because um, Celia is a lesbian and Evelyn is bisexual. And we get, Have you been with anyone else? Any men? She asked. She was always jealous of the men, worried she couldn't compete. I was jealous of the women, worried I wouldn't compare. So yeah, uh, Celia gets married, uh, Evelyn gets married, and basically Celia and Evelyn are in love, and their two husbands are in love as well. And um, they kind of, they call it like a four-way beard. We get, um, Celia and I spent our nights together in this apartment. Harry spent his nights with John at their place. We went out to dinner in public, the four of us looking like two pairs of heterosexuals without a heterosexual in the bunch. The tabloids called us America's favourite double daters. I even heard rumours that the four of us were swingers, which wasn't that crazy for that period of time. It really makes you think, doesn't it? That people were so eager to believe we were swapping spouses but would have been scandalised to know we were monogamous and queer. We get this great little one-two between Celia and Evelyn, which I thought was very cute. You love me, she said. Oh my god, what an understatement, I told her. You love me so much you can't see straight. I love you so much that when I sometimes get a look at all the crazy fan mail you get, I think, well, sure, that makes sense. I want to collect her eyelashes too. And Evelyn's quite clear on the difference between sex and sexuality. She, she says, there's a difference between sexuality and sex. I used sex to get what I wanted. Sex is just an act. Sexuality is a sincere expression of desire and pleasure. And Evelyn talks about how she ended up losing Celia. Um... I want you to have it in my words. When Celia said she couldn't have all of me, it was because I was selfish and because I was scared of losing everything I had. Not because I had two sides of me that one person could never fulfill. I broke Celia's heart because I spent half my time loving her and the other half hiding how much I loved her. Never once did I cheat on Celia. If we're defining cheating by desiring another person and then making love to that person, I never once did that. When I was with Celia, I was with Celia. The same way any woman married to a man is with that man. Did I look at other people? Sure, just like anyone in a relationship does. But I loved Celia and I shared my true self only with Celia. The problem was, I used my body to get other things I wanted. And I didn't stop doing that even for her. That's my tragedy. That I used my body when it was all I had and then I kept using it even when I had other options. I kept using it even when I knew it would hurt the woman I loved. And what's more, I made her complicit in it. I put her in a position to continually have to approve of my choices at her own expense. Celia may have left me in a huff, but it was a death by a thousand cuts. I hurt her with these tiny scratches day after day, and then I got surprised when it left a wound too big to heal. And uh, Monique, she says, uh, you're hard on yourself, I think. Celia wasn't perfect. She could be cruel. 
Evelyn shrugged slightly. She always made sure the bad was outweighed by so much good. I, well, I didn't do that for her. I made it 50-50, which is about the cruelest thing you can do to someone you love. Give them just enough good to make them stick through a hell of a lot of bad. Of course, I realised all this when she left me, and I tried to fix it, but it was too late. As she said, she simply couldn't do it anymore, because it took me too long to figure out what I cared about. Not because of my sexuality. And Monique kind of comes to term with her own divorce, and we get this great couple of lines. Sometimes divorce isn't an earth-shattering loss. Sometimes it's just two people waking up out of a fog. And this is sad, but very realistic. Uh, I was 50 years old. There was an entire new generation of actresses to compete with. They were all gorgeous with smooth skin and shiny hair. When you're known for being gorgeous, you cannot imagine suffering a fate worse than standing next to someone and falling short. It did not matter how beautiful I used to be. The clock was ticking and everyone could see it. My roles were starting to dry up. The parts I was being offered were the mothers of the great roles being offered to women literally half my age. Life in Hollywood is a bell curve and I'd prolonged my time at the top for as long as possible. I'd lasted longer than most. But I'd come around the corner now, and they were all but putting me out to pasture. And she meets uh, a cab driver called Nick, who he kind of has an important part in this, I suppose. Uh, and he asks her for advice, and she says, I was going to tell him that it's mostly luck, and that you have to be willing to deny your heritage, to commodify your body, to lie to good people, to sacrifice who you love in the name of what people will think, and to choose the false version of yourself time and time again, until you forgot who you started out as, or why you started doing it to begin with. Um, I will say my criticism of the last 50 or so pages is that the pacing suddenly changes and we kind of ramp through the last 20, 30 years of her life in about 5% of the book. It didn't, didn't really make sense. Um, and you have a lot of these big revelations again and, and I just think they could have been dragged out a bit more. Like, I mean, I really enjoyed reading this so it could easily have had another 50 or 100 pages and it would have still worked, you know? And we get this sort of twist at the end. I'd been told there was a twist. To be honest, I wouldn't have called it a twist, personally. Um, I think it's just part of the plot, but yeah. anyway, we get a revelation, certainly. Um, the whole book is a book of revelations, if you'll pardon, pardon the Bible pun. Um, and we learn this about um, Monique's father. Uh, he loved you. He was willing to turn down romantic love in order to stand by your side. Do you know what an amazing father you had? Do you know how loved you were? Plenty of men say they'll never leave their families, but your father was put to the test and didn't even blink. And I love this. Um, so she asks her mum about her dad. She says, um, what was he like with you? Oh, he was very romantic. He used to buy me chocolates every single year on the 3rd of May. I thought your anniversary was in September. It was, she says laughing. He just always spoiled me on the 3rd of May for some reason. He said there weren't enough official holidays to celebrate me. He said, it he, said he needed to make one up just for me. And I might do that for my girlfriend because I think that's very romantic. All right, and then we get to the uh, acknowledgements. And I just love the fact um, that she acknowledges a uh, book blogger she says to the book bloggers who write and tweet and snap photos all in the effort of telling people about my work you are the reason I can continue to do what I do very nice uh, and then my edition also had a reading group guide and um I found question seven interesting. It says, at several points in the novel, Evelyn tells her story through the second person, you. How does this kind of narration affect the reading experience? Why do you think she chooses these memories to recount in this way? And I hadn't even picked up on that. Um, and I normally hate second person as well. So the fact that it, it happened kind of so naturally, um, I was pretty impressed with. But yeah, all in all, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, um, I did really enjoy it. I also enjoyed Daisy Jones and the Six, so Taylor Jenkins Reid is going to become one of my authors who I want to read everything they've ever written by. I'll be giving this to my girlfriend as well because I think she'll enjoy it and I'm keen to get her thoughts. I gave it a, a strong 4 out of 5. It could have been a 4.5 out of 5, but for that sort of little pacing um, change towards the end where it just felt a little bit rushed towards the end. Um, she does say as well in, in her uh, like afterward and acknowledgements she was pregnant um, so like her baby basically grew inside her while she was writing this. I think it said she was like the size of a like a period on the page or something uh, to begin with and then by the time that the book was finished she was like ready to be born and it, it does make me wonder whether she kind of rushed the ending of it just to get it done before her baby was born, you know? Because um, when you've got a new baby, I think that's going to take a, take a toll on your writing. So I could understand why she did that, but it, it just it came across as though that ending was rushed anyway. Um, or not even rushed, it just felt different to the rest of it because of that different pacing. But yeah, I would recommend it. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.